This is video installation number three of my home theater PC build. Why has it taken me three videos so far to complete this system, you ask? Well, if you missed the first two videos, I suggest you watch those first and then come talk to me. To say we had a few technical difficulties would be a gross understatement. But today, the only thing standing in between me and finishing this build once and for all is this brief advertisement from today's sponsor. Before we continue, this video is brought to you by Keoxia and their high-performance SSDs. The BG5 is designed to deliver a balance of performance, cost, and power for everyday gamers and PC users. Bring PCIe Gen 4 NVMe storage to your desktop or laptop with a compact M.2 2230 form factor and leverage Keoxia's 5th Gen 112 layer Bix Flash 3D memory for best-in-class performance and endurance. For enterprise workloads, the CD7 series features PCIe Gen 5 technology that achieves 32 gigatransfers per second per PCIe lane. It sports the latest enterprise and data center standard form factor and has been optimized for cooling, capacity, and performance. The XD6 is another EDSFF SSD with PCIe Gen 4 capability designed to the Open Compute Project NVMe SSD specification endorsed by big hyperscalers. As an E1.S drive, the XD6 is fully hot swappable, unlike M.2 drives, along with having higher capacities and delivering more performance. For more information on all Keoxia has to offer, click on the link in the description below. So if you guys remember from the last video, I had a bunch of issues with the motherboard that we were using, which was an ASUS ROG Strix Z690i gaming Wi-Fi. It had a bad DIMM slot. The system wouldn't even post if that slot was ever populated. And additionally, I f***ed up the board even more when trying to power it on with a power supply using the incorrect power supply cables. I heard a little buzzing, like currents going through something, but... Oh, Holy. Um, yeah, that's uh, not gonna get into that. So I returned that board. I returned it for a full refund. I could have gotten a replacement, but I have too much trauma associated with that board at this point to ever want to use it again. So instead I purchased a completely different board from a different brand. This is the MSI Meg Z690i Unify. This is the board. I literally just took it out of the package a moment ago. And look at, there's already a gash in the IO cover, just further reinforcing that this is in fact a cursed build. But like I said, I'm gonna try to get through it today. We're gonna take it nice and easy, starting with a test boot outside of the chassis. We're not going to touch the case for now. We're just going to wire up all the essential components and see if we can get a post. <laughs> All right, we've got all of our core components connected. We're ready for a test boot. But first, you might be wondering why is the cooler different? We are now using the Fantex Glacier 1 240 millimeter AIO. The reason for the switch is because I don't have an LGA 1700 bracket for this cooler. I made the mistake of thinking this was an LGA 1700 bracket. So when I put it behind the MSI motherboard to try to line up the holes, I noticed that the holes weren't lining up at all. The drilled holes on the motherboard PCB were actually about three millimeters wider than the holes on this bracket. And that makes perfect sense because the hole width spacing on LGA 1200 brackets is three millimeters more narrow than LGA 1700 brackets. And I completely forgot this fact. So I was freaking out and I was being an idiot. And I was thinking like, what did, uh, did MSI like drill the holes wrong on this board? Why is, why is this bracket working? So I called Paul. I was like, Paul, it's not, what the hell's going on? I'm freaking out, man. And then he reminded me that there was a difference in spacing between 1700 and 1200. And that maybe the bracket I have is actually in fact an LGA 1200 bracket. And of course he was right because Paul's always right. And by the way, the reason why the Arctic Cooler was working with our previous ASUS board is because that board has two sets of drilled holes for LGA 1200 and 1700, whereas the MSI motherboard only has holes for LGA 1700. So there's a very long-winded answer as to why we swapped coolers, but because this cooler actually has a much thinner radiator than the Arctic Cooler over there, we're able to use the Fantex T30 fans, which are 30 millimeters thick, and these are some of the best, if not the best, radiator fans on the market right now, which should help with our thermals. I've had enough dilly dallying, let's get this test boot underway. Come on. Here we go, here we go. Spinning, spinning, spinning. Uh-oh, what's happening? Power cycling? <sighs> when we did a test boot in the last video, we were also power cycling, but that was just like infinite power cycling. It's normal sometimes for a PC to just power cycle once or twice, but is that what's happening here or not? No signal. Why no signal? What's wrong with you? What's going on? I am going to unplug the display port out of our GPU and plug it directly into the motherboard and see if we can actually get a video signal from the integrated graphics on our 12900K. It's a nice IO on the back of this board. We got HDMI and display port. There's also Thunderbolt and mini display port. Fun. All right, let's go again. Oh, oh snap, bruh, bruh, okay. 
Um, I hope our RTX 3090 is okay. Should we, we should, we should try it again. I'll try it again and I'll clear the CMOS this time. There's a clear CMOS button on the back of the board. Actually, I lied. I'm gonna test this out first. This is a GTX 1050 Ti. We're just gonna pop this in and see if we get a video signal with this guy. Here we go again. We're power cycling again. What the heck? Why are we power cycling every time a graphics card's installed? Oh, shoot. Ah, it came back on. Okay, that took a while. I, I was just about to turn the PC off actually, and then the video signal popped up. Obviously this rules out the motherboard's PCIe slot being bad, uh, cause it's clearly working with this card. So why don't we pop the RTX 3090 back in there and maybe it'll work this time. <sighs> I'm thinking if this doesn't work, maybe it's got something to do with the PCI Express key. Oh, shoot! Woo! Oh, oh, okay, there it is. Oh, okay, scaling's a little off, but that's fine. We will take care of that later. All right, everything is working as it should. Wait, what just happened? What's happening? Oh no, you guys saw it, right? There was a video signal and then it vanished. Why, why did it do that? Is the GPU sliding out of the slot or something? Cause it's so massive. I'm gonna stick this under it, kind of crop it up a little bit. I don't know how much that helps. What? Okay, what the heck? Was that it? Hold on. If I remove this, if I remove, if I remove this, does the video signal go out? No, I think, I'm, I think I'm just psyching myself out right now. Still, that's a little weird. I'm gonna reboot it and just see what happens. Okay, so far so good. All right, scaling, scaling looks better now. The video signal may have cut out because we just switched from a GTX 1050 Ti, and then when we popped in the RTX 3090, the system might have just needed a minute to recognize the new card. I think, I think we're good. I think we're good. I think we're finally ready to move on to installing all these components into the case again, hopefully for the last time, or I will yeet myself into a wood chipper. Okay, moment of truth. Let's just do it. All right. Yes. Yes, beautiful. HTPC 2.0, everyone. It's complete, it's good to go. I'm just gonna wait till it gets to the desktop before I keep talking. Come on, come on, I saw you. <sighs> the f Screen's not coming back. Let's, let's reboot. Why is it not working now? Is it the riser cable? I make sure one of these ports isn't funky. Reboot again. Oh, okay. What? Are one of the display ports on this thing bad? This display port right here wasn't working. Let's try plugging it back in. Okay. No signal. No signal. All right, let's try the very top display port port. <laughs> wow, I think we have a bad display port. One of the ports is bad. What the heck? How did that happen? Let me verify that the HDMI port works. HDMI one. Why are they gonna make them so hard to reach? Come on, dude. Oh, there we go. Oh, I gotta change the source. Duh. Nope, okay. It just auto, auto set to HDMI. Okay, we got a bad port. One of the display ports is bad on the GPU. It's so strange, it's so, so very strange. I'm cool with that. I'm just happy the system's finally posting. It's finally done, thank God. Well, I shouldn't say we're completely out of the woods yet. We still have to actually test it. So that's what's gonna happen next. We're gonna benchmark this guy for the next few hours. I'm also gonna benchmark our old HTPC. We'll compare the data between the two PCs to see if the gains we're getting with the new one are worth the absolute hell that it's put me through over the last three weeks. You better perform. You better, you better freaking perform, you son of a bitch. All right, benchmarking is complete. I'm back here at home and I'm very excited to share with you guys these results. They are, they're pretty wild. But first I wanted to go over the PC specs, the, the PC specs between both of the systems that we're comparing, because this is not an apples to apples comparison like uh, a typical CPU or GPU review. We're comparing two completely different computers with different specs across the board. So I wanna make that very clear. The two differences that'll make the most performance impact between these systems is by far and away the CPU 
and the graphics card. So we're going from a Ryzen 7 3700X, which was always running stock, uh, to a Core i9-12900K. Uh, and it is undervolted, I'll explain that in just a bit. But this is obviously a huge step up. I mean, 3700X isn't even current gen, and 12900K is really top of the line of, of what Intel offers currently. And then we also have the graphics card going from an RTX 3070 FE to an MSI RTX 3090, Gaming X Trio. So not only are we definitely stepping up in terms of uh, you know how big this GPU is, but it's also uh, a custom board partner variant, which is the Gaming X Trio. It's going to have a more aggressive factory overclock than what Nvidia has put on their own FE cards. It's also worth noting that uh, the Ryzen 7 3700X in our uh, old HTPC is being cooled or was being cooled by a 120 millimeter liquid AIO from Corsair, the H80i versus the 12900K being cooled by a 240 millimeter liquid AIO, the Fantex Glacier 1, but that's that's a given. There's no way a 120 rad would, would work on a 12900K. It just, it just runs too damn hot. You'd have to undervolt it so much to the point where you would really start cutting into too much performance. That's what's great about the Evolve Shift XT. One of the great things is that it actually supports up to 240 millimeter radiators, which we were unable to do in the old HTPC, uh, which had a Silverstone SG13. The other nice thing about the Shift XT in this case is that it, it compartments compartmentalizes the, the GPU sort of separately from the motherboard and CPU area. So it's kind of isolating or separating these two hot spots, whereas the SG13 kind of just lumped it all together in one one hot box, so to speak. But let's talk about temperatures really quickly. We'll go over thermals before we dive into performance. As you can see here, we've got the blue numbers. That's our, those are our max CPU temps, and then uh, the green is our max GPU temps. This is after a 15 minute run in Red Dead Redemption 2 at 4K, which all the benchmarks today are run at 4K because that's the resolution of my TV in my living room, and that's, that's what I'm gonna be playing at all the time. So uh, you can see here we went from 73 uh, degrees Celsius on that 3700X to 79C on the 12900K. And this is after undervolting that Core i9 chip, because before undervolting, I was hitting around 91, 92C, which is just way too hot. And yes, we were thermal throttling at that point. So I did an adaptive offset uh, undervolt of like 0.05 volts, and that brought us way down, chopped off more than 10 degrees, uh, something that was very sustainable, still not downright chilly, I would say. It's, it's still pretty warm, um, but considering how much power is going through this little shoebox of a, of a case um, on a 12900K, the 79C is, is much more sustainable. And then on our GPU, we kind of flipped here. We went hotter on the CPU, but we went cooler on the, on the GPU, going from 78C to 73C. I did, however, tweak the fan curve on the RTX 3090 in order to uh, drop the temps a bit. I think it was getting closer to 7980C, and then I, I dialed in a pretty modest, like pretty mild fan curve to the point where even under full load, it's very quiet. And the fact that, you know, I'll be playing with game audio, of course, in the living room, it just completely drowns out any sort of fan noise. So it wasn't a problem at all, but it definitely brought down our temperatures to uh, a much more respectable figure. Moving on to performance, our first game. Again, all these are tested at 4K, 3840 by 2160. Um, Halo Infinite was the first game I tested, and right out of the gate, we're, we're seeing some huge gains here. This is on the high preset. We're going from 51 frames per second on average on the old HTPC to 75. That's a 47% bump in average frame rates. And the 1% lows are, are just as impressive. Going from 41 to getting over that 60 frame per second average on the new uh, system is just fantastic. I was being cautiously optimistic when I first ran this test. I was like, okay, I shouldn't get too excited because you know maybe this is an outlier and you know the rest of the games are gonna uh, perform as well on the new system. Oh, I was wrong. In Far Cry 5, uh, we went from 71 frames per second on average to 106 frames per second. That's a 49% bump. Absolutely insane results here, going from 63 on the 1% low to 84. And if you're wondering, yes, this does make a noticeable difference in the gameplay experience. Going from 60 to 70 FPS to over 100 is uh, noticeable, to say the least. Control, just ridiculous uh, bump up here, 60 to 93. And this was with uh, at 4K, but with a 1080p uh, render resolution. We also had a high preset, DLSS was enabled, and ray tracing was set to high. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, this is wild. This is the biggest uplift that we saw in any title going from 60 frames per second on average to 109. That's an 82% bump. That's almost double the performance. I think the biggest reason for that is because Shadow of the Tomb Raider is such a CPU intensive game. Whereas um, a lot of the other titles on this list are more GPU bound. And so having the 12900K in there isn't having as much of an impact as it is here. Um, so when you combine that with the RTX 3090, we're just seeing some 
insane uplift here. In the Division 2, we went from 52 frames per second to 80 on average. That's a 54% bump, still very nice. And look at those 1% lows too, 35, pretty pretty sad there. That's getting close to Chopville, going up to 59, almost hitting that 60 FPS average. And this was on the Ultra preset. And then we have Red Dead Redemption 2, another very impressive title for the new HTPC, going from 69, even though I, I do respect that figure. I'd much rather game at 110 frames per second, which is a 59% gain in average frame rates. 1% lows look great as well. This was not even maxed out. This is medium preset DLSS balance. And then the last game I tested was Cyberpunk 2077. Um, this is the most demanding title out of the list. It's one of the most crushing games of modern times. And uh, we went from 43 frames per second on average with the old system to 66. That's a 53% bump. That makes the game a lot more playable and a lot more enjoyable um, than, than previously. And just to reiterate how demanding this game is, this wasn't even at max settings. This was the medium preset DLSS was on performance and ray tracing was set to medium. And finally, here's what the bottom line looks like for how much faster the new HTPC is over the old one on average. I took all the frames rendered across all seven game titles we just looked at, and if the HTPC 1.0 is performing at 100%, the new system is performing 57% faster on average. That is absolutely insane. Uh, I mean, if this was, obviously we're just comparing two completely different computers, but if this was like a CPU or GPU review, this is like a multi-generational performance gap. Despite the absolute hell that this system put me through, and the amount of hell that I put it through, because I was at fault here too, when I look at the end result and I look at the numbers, it was absolutely worth every step of the way to get to this point. The performance is staggering, and it's well beyond my expectations, but at the end of the day, what I'm most excited about for this series is to finally game on my new HTPC in the living room, so let's go do that. Before we continue, special thanks to NordPass for sponsoring this video. If you've ever been the victim of a data breach or having your personal info used against you, you know it's an awful scenario that leaves you feeling hustled, scammed, and bamboozled. It actually happened to me a few years ago on Black Friday when I noticed hundreds of dollars of fraudulent activity on my credit card. Back then, I didn't have a password manager or any effective cybersecurity protections in place, and I feel like if I had known about NordPass back then, I might have saved myself from a very stressful Thanksgiving weekend. NordPass is an essential cybersecurity tool with tons of built-in functionality to protect you on all fronts. As a secure password manager, NordPass generates complex passwords and lets you store them all in one place for utmost security and convenience. You can also securely store your credit card info with confidence, since NordPass is a zero-knowledge password manager. That means only you can see what's in your encrypted vault. Not even the NordPass team has access to anything you've stored with them. Beyond password managing, one of my favorite NordPass features is their data breach scanner, so you can easily find out if your online account or credit card info has been leaked. It even identifies where and when the leak happened and what type of data was compromised. These powerful features are just tip of the iceberg for what NordPass has to offer. And right now you can get 50% off NordPass Premium and a month free by visiting nordpass.com bitwit or using code bitwit at checkout. With their 30 day money back guarantee, there's nothing to lose. So check out NordPass today by clicking the link in the description. I kind of want to start off with some Halo Infinite because the game looks really good on a big screen and obviously it's well formatted for a gamepad, being Halo and stuff. Oh. Ah. Uh. Well, looks like uh, Ian already beat me to the punch. Playing some uh, some Star Citizen. Nice. How much, uh, how much longer are you going to be playing, Ian? Ian? Okay, he's he's obviously a, a bit preoccupied. That's fine. I'm no, I'm I'm happy that he's enjoying the fruits of my hard labor. Anyway, I guess I'll cut it off here, guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, toss a like before you go. Get subscribed for more tech content on the way. And as always, I will see you guys in the next video.